Let's have a word of prayer, and then let's get going. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for allowing us to be here, Lord. My prayer never changes. It's your time, it's your place, it's your people, it's your word. It's your day, and I am a tool in your belt to be used by you, Lord. Use me as you see fit. Talk to us, because I need it to. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Um, in going with the theme of the scriptures, it's kind of funny how God works things out. The theme of the scriptures and songs kind of matched what I was getting ready to talk about today. And I had something else planned, and then I didn't like it as of yesterday. I had been planning it all week, and yesterday I said, I don't like it anymore. So open up your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 5, please. Luke chapter 5. It's not going to be a long day. We're probably going to end early. But I want to share some things with you, and I want to read through Luke 5. I'm going to read from the New King James Version. It's Jesus calling his first disciples. And we're going to read 1 through 11, and then I'll go back and walk through this and key in on about four points that I think are important for us today. Still hear some pages turning, I like that. That's old school for me. Church I grew up in, pastor used to wait till the pages stopped turning and everybody said amen. We were all together. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Genesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from that boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered and said, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, that's a key point, and we're going to come back to that. Because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken, and so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. And Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid, for now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. We all know this story. If you don't know this story, you should. It's the first calling of Jesus' disciples. He had been praying all night to his father, who should I talk to? Who should I choose for my disciples? He had been talking with his father. This wasn't a random event. He intended to meet with Peter today. But the way he did it is just, that's just Jesus. That's just the way he does things. But there's four things that I see in here that I want to talk about today as they pertain to us. Number one, Jesus is out preaching and they were already crowding around and listening to him. People are scrambling, searching, looking for God. I started something about a month ago, about a month next week, and it's been so interesting to me to see people and, and meet with people on social media that are scrambling and looking for God. The Bible studies that have come out of it, the conversations of people who won't step a foot in the church but will, are looking for God. They have all these questions and all of these unanswered problems and issues that they're facing. They're dealing with so much. They want answers. They don't know where to find answers because they keep looking at us and not looking at him. And we humans will fail each other in a heartbeat. We have a job of directing people to him. But now here he is and the people around him listening. And apparently they were pressing in so much trying to get so close to him that he had to step out on a boat and back out from the shore, number one, so they couldn't press in any closer. They're pushing the man in the water. 
Number two, so he could actually see all the people and get out to them. I've had students, we'll play uh, Jeopardy in my class, Bible Jeopardy, and they think I don't see them raising their hands. So they begin to press forward to my desk. And when they press forward, I can't see anybody else, right? They come jumping. I got kids who do jumping jacks, cartwheels. Mr. Eddie, me, I know, I know, I know. I know you know, you've answered the last five. I'm trying to get to somebody else. They don't understand. They're blocking me from seeing everyone. So Jesus presses out onto the shore, uh, onto the, 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 the water. And he sees an empty boat, so he gets down onto Simon's boat. And in verse 2, he said, He saw the water's edge, two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. They're already cleaning up for the day. They're working. They're doing a good thing. They're getting the nets ready for the next day. They've been fishing all night. You have to get those nets cleaned, dried, repair any rips, because tomorrow you got to go out again and do it again. So they're doing their job, and it's a good thing they're doing. They're trying to be thorough. And then this man gets into one of the boats belonging to Simon and asks him to pull out a little bit, ask him to pull out into the shallows. Simon says, Lord, um, we've been out all night, but sure, I'll pull out a little bit. And he presses out, and Jesus is teaching. Now, Simon has to just sit there and wait. You know how you want to do something for somebody, but then you get to go home? Hey, you need $5? Okay, cool. Here's $5. Go get some gas, and then I get to go home. No. Simon had to stay because this was his boat. He had to just sit down and wait for this man to finish teaching, which means he caught a sermon because he was sitting there listening. He was probably trying to be respectful and not finish cleaning the nets while the man is talking, not make noise while the man is talking and teaching. Obviously, something great is happening, and so he's just sitting there hearing it all. And he's in the shallows. And then when he had finished speaking, now he's done talking, and Jesus has a captive audience he says, hey, uh, why don't you put out into the deep water and let your nets down? And Simon, of course, famously answered and said, Master, we've been going all night. We've worked hard. We haven't caught anything. But not because of what I am, not because of who I am, but Master, because who you are, and because you say so. See, there's a difference when God asks us to do something and you know who he is. You know who was talking. You know who made the request. And it's not because of who you are. I am nothing. I am worthless. I, I, I can't do the job. I just failed, Lord. I was there all night. I just failed. But because you say so, God, I will try it one more time. I will go at it one more time. Which means not only did he get a sermon, but it's quite possible that Simon had heard at least of this man, had known a little bit about who he was because he knew how to respond because you say so. I've heard about the things you've told other people to do. I've heard stories about when you say to do something. I've seen, I've heard, I've, I've read about things when you say to do something. <clears throat> I open my Bible all the time, read about tales of God's snatching victory out of the jaws of defeat, God closing the mouths of lions, God shutting down and destroying giants, God changing kingdoms overnight, changing kings overnight, God healing, God teaching. So when God tells me to do something, I have a background to say, because you say so, I'll do it. Even if it's scary, even if it's awkward, even if it pulls me out of my comfortability. I cannot be a couch Christian. I cannot finish the work sitting on my couch watching YouTube. It won't work. So God, when you say get up and go door to door, 
plug for AZ Youth Rush. When you say get up and go to Bible study, when you say get up and go tell my family, when you say get up and go tell my coworkers, Lord, I tried that already. I've been praying for my aunt for years. But because you say so, I'll go at it one more time. I'll step out into the deep end one more time. I'll try one more time. I'll forgive one more time. I'll extend myself one more time. I'll open my arms to them one more time. Because you say so, I'll do it. <clears throat> the Bible says when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. They signaled their partners in the other boat and to come help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Here's, here's, here, here's the funny part. You can't sink a boat Jesus is on, but the boat began to sink, right? The nets were so full, the boat so full, Jesus is just sitting there smiling at them. I told you to let down your nets. They call their partners over. Their boat begins to fill up with fish, and Jesus is sitting there going, them too. I'll take them too. But the thing that I saw the most in reading this scripture, because I know me, knew you or not, heard from you or not, I'm tired. I'm weary. I've been working all night and just failed. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to feed my family, how I'm going to take care of things at home. I'm trying to figure out how am I going to make up for this wasted night. I basically worked all night and got nothing to show for it. I have to make up for this day. And you get in my boat? Man, get in somebody else's boat. Go somewhere else. I need to go home. I got to figure out how to tell my wife I ain't get nothing. And yet, Simon, later to be known as Peter, allows Jesus to not only get in the boat, but push off into the shallows. And somewhere in those shallows, he began to trust Jesus enough that when Jesus says, go out into the deep, he said, I'll do that too. A lot of times, folks, we not only do we want to stay on shore because it's safe, we got enough problems to deal with on the shore, then we might go out into the shallows. We might go out to where we can still put our feet on the ground. We might extend ourselves and get out of our comfortability a little bit just to where we can still see the shore. But what happens when Jesus asks us to go out into the deep? Because if he can't trust you in the shallows, there's no way he can trust you in the deep. And if you can't trust him in the shallows, there's no way you'll trust him in the deep. We have things that go on in our lives. It's, it's real easy for me to say, I trust God when I'm up here on this pulpit. This is easy. I'm doing his work. I'm stepping in and letting him use me. But what about when you trust God? Will you trust God in going through family history and forgiving wrongs? Because that family history can be some deep water. I counseled some people last week that couldn't even tell me what the family beef was. I talked to both of them individually. They couldn't even tell me who started it and who did what, yet they've been mad for 25 years. 25 years and you don't know even what's wrong. And are refusing to be the first one to say I'm sorry. Refusing. I hope they're watching because I just called them out. They're refusing. The ridiculousness of the boxes that we put God in because we will not trust him in the deep. Sometimes we won't even get off the shorelines. We'll look and see what's wrong and say, mm, 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 and walk away. We won't even get our feet wet. And if Jesus can't trust me in the shallow, 
How's he going to trust me in the deep? If I can't trust him in the shallow, if I won't even trust him enough to let him on my boat, if I won't trust him enough to get on his boat, if I won't trust him at all, how is this relationship going to work? Because Pastor Gary has taught this over and over again, and I'm, I started to believe it, but the more I've, I've lived, the more I understand. The deepest level of love is trust. If I can't trust you, how am I going to love you? I got to trust you. I got a guy right now who is struggling. He has keys to my home. He comes and goes as he needs to, but he calls me every time. He leaves my home better than I leave it every time. I trust him. Nothing has gone missing. So I gave him keys. He does not have a place to stay. He's clean, he's got a job, but the job doesn't pay much. He's saving up. But when he needs to, he calls me and says, can I, can I come over and wash clothes? Absolutely. I bought your laundry detergent. It's up there in the corner for you. And when I come home, it's like nobody's been there. Sometimes I wish he was around just to have some conversation. Other times he'll call me and say, is it okay if I come by and get some rest? Absolutely. Go by, sleep, packs everything up, cleans up and leaves in the morning before I even am awake. I trust him. We have to have that kind of a relationship, that kind of a trust with Almighty God. That I will go where he says and do what he asks, not because of who I am, but because of who he is. Because he said so. By the way, that trust goes to not just starting relationships, but ending them too. What do you want to go do when God says that's not for you? You going to fight him or are you going to trust him? What are we going to do when God says don't go there, but everybody else is going there, that's not for you. I pass by here every day. I drive past the truck that I want. Big old 32-inch rim suburban big dog truck. <laughs> yeah. Big dog truck. Every day I drive home from this place, either school or the church, and I go north, and that truck is sitting at the house. I went and looked at it. The guy's got it for sale. And every day I pass by and say, Jesus, that's the truck I want. But that's also the truck Jesus said no to. He told me no. You don't need that truck because you're going to act up in that truck. I'll be good. It's not for you. So every day I just pass by and say, I want that one. Please help me work on my character so I can have that truck, please. please. I'll be good. I promise I'll be good. But I got to trust him that he said no. I just make my petitions known. I petited. Petited? I petitioned. That word. I want that truck, God. I thought of all the things I could do. I could take my kids off-roading. I could pull up right to the lake. We could fish out the back of the truck. We could sleep in the truck, God. It's amazing, God. I, I even tried to make a bargain. I'll do work for you in that truck, God. He said no. I got to trust him. They caught such a large number of fish that they had to ask for help. So James and John came over to help. And they pulled out and they get to shore. And Jesus says to Simon, do not be afraid. Now you will fish for people. Oh, I skipped something. Hold on. Verse 8. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell on his knees and said, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. It seems to me that God did not care what Simon's past was or who he was. What he cared about was, was he willing to do as God asked him to do? 
And that's real, real special for people like me. Didn't matter what my past was. Didn't matter what my sins were. Didn't matter what my family lineage was. Didn't matter where I came from. Didn't matter where I've been. He says, will you do as I asked you to do? You trusted me in the shallows. Will you trust me in the deep? And he pulled out such a large number of fish that he had to ask, he had to ask for help. And then he tells him, I'm going to make you fishers of people, fishers of men. So they pulled up their boats on the shore, left everything, and followed him. Their greatest day of fishing in the history of their business. And they left it. The Bible doesn't even say they counted it. They left it. Could have probably paid off all his debts. Could have probably bought another boat. Could have lived high on the hog. And Jesus said, follow me. And they left it to go where he's going and to follow him. What does this mean for us today? This is what I see. When we are about God's business, he's got to trust us in the shallows. We've got to trust him in the shallows. That's where you build a relationship. The worst thing you can do to a kid, because it was done to me, is teach him how to swim by kicking him in the deep end. That sucks. I swam drowned. I swound, right? It didn't feel good. When my father saw it, he made sure that the person who pushed me in the pool got into the pool. That's all, I'm gonna leave it at that. I'm just gonna leave it at that. My father taught me by putting his hand underneath my stomach and walking me in the shallows. And that's how I taught my kids put my hand underneath them, and we worked in the shallows. Now they're jumping and diving and jackknifing into the deep end. They trust. When it was time to go to the deep end, my father went with me. He said, jump, and I trusted him because he had taught me in the shallows. It was only natural now to go to the deep end. Jesus wants our church to get out of the shallows and go to the deep end. Because when we go to the deep end with him, because he said so, not because we got this bright idea, not because we had this amazing thing that could happen to us, but because he said so, when we go with him to the deep end, he says, I will fill your boat up so much that you're going to need help to bring it all in. Wouldn't it be amazing if we had to call the conference and say, listen, we're baptizing so many people, y'all better get down here. We need some help. Wouldn't it be amazing if we had to call Beacon Light, Central, Maricopa, uh, uh, who else is it, Phoenix Central Spanish, uh, uh, um, all the other churches around and say, get over here. We need bodies. You know what was fun? Is watching all the churches show up to do the booking. And we have the great controversy books to bind them all up. We had like five, six churches in our building for that project. To take all those great controversy books and wrap them up and put them on pallets. I was here trying to help get that stuff over to the, the place, driving trucks. and It was fun to see the churches here. Wouldn't it be amazing if everybody had to come over because we trusted God in the deep end and he blessed us with a bounty that was so big that we were teaching, baptizing, praising the Lord, that this place was filled up and we had to have five services, not just two. Wouldn't that be something? And wouldn't it be amazing if God says, great, you got that going. Now follow me. I got something else for you to do. We have to trust God even on our greatest day. If he says, now we're going over there, we leave everything and go. And the question is, for us, do we trust God like that? Do we have that relationship with God like that? Where we're willing to let him on our boat, knowing that everything's about to change, knowing that we're tired, knowing that we're frustrated from the night before and what has happened before, knowing that all we want to do is go home and deal with the problems at hand. And yet he wants on our boat. Do we push off for sure? And trust him that 
Well, I guess he's teaching, so I'll just sit and wait. Not going to leave my boat. Ain't got nothing else to do. Do we trust him when he says, when he gets done and we finally think, oh, great, now I can go get some breakfast and go home and take a bath. I smell like stinky seawater. I've been sweating all night. And he says, ah, go out to the deep end. Lord, I just sent out 450,000 flyers. No one came. I just sent out a mailing. I just did an email blast. No one came. Now you want me to do it again? Yeah. This time do it on the other side. Okay, God. Because you say so. I'll do it again. Wouldn't it be amazing if he if we trusted him, not only for going where he wants us to go, but then he could trust us with the bounty that's coming in. Because the people are starving for Jesus. It'd be amazing if he could trust us with what comes in. That we had to go get help. That we had to close school one day and get all of our older kids over here to help hand out tracts and take and register people so we could get names and dates, addresses. That we had to have a child care so full that it took up all six rooms back there because the people were packing the house wanting to hear from Jesus. But it starts not in the deep, it starts on the shore. It starts when Jesus walks up and steps in our boat and asks us to push off. Because you notice Jesus didn't come at nighttime when they got started their day. He didn't come in the middle of the day when it was lunchtime. He, he came at the end of the day, early in the morning, when they were coming in, when they were packing up, when they were wrapping up, when they were about to close, when they were tired, when they were beaten down, when they were at their lowest point because they hadn't done anything all night long. Then he came and said, will you trust me? We better be ready when Jesus comes. You better keep that lamp lit and that oil burning. You better have something in the tank you better have something reserved because he's not coming when you expect it. He's not coming when you think he should. He's coming on his time when the time is just mwah. It's perfect. He's coming for you. And he wants to know, will you trust him? Collectively, will we trust him? Will we be willing to go out on the deep end one more time? We are set up to be the bad guys, people. The whole world is turning on Jesus. Folks are burning Bibles. Kids are, kids are losing their minds. Adults are letting it happen. Parenting has gone away. I don't know what's going on. My mother has stage four cancer and she will still sock me right in the face, okay? Let me get out of line just one time. She is still my mother. She is still a parent. I don't know what's going on, but I know we've got one thing and one thing only that we give at this church, and that is Jesus. It's Jesus. But we have to trust him where we are because he wants to take us to the place where he can gather in his children and save them from the clutches of the enemy that is trying to steal everything that God worked so hard and gave everything to get for them. He's trying to steal it back. I'm not here just to make people in our church feel good about Jesus. I'm here to go show everybody out there who he is. We have him. We're in the house there are so many lost people out there who need him. It's time to go to the deep end and go fishing. Let's pray.
Lord, <coughs> this, um, this story from the beginning of the disciples, when you call them out, is just so very fitting today. We don't want to get complacent where we are. You have purpose for us as a church body, as a people, as individuals that is so much greater than where we are. These were fishermen, and you decided and, and showed them that they had it all backwards. They were fishers of men. These guys had been working and toiling all night and finally had, thanks to you, their biggest catch ever, and you said, that's nothing. Follow me. I'll show you things. I'll show you something. That's nothing. Father, don't let us get complacent where we are. Don't let us get complacent with what we have. Don't let us get complacent with the routine. You have such great heights you want to take your people in the mission of saving those whom you've called your own. Lord, we have to be about our Father's business. We have to push off from the shore. We've got to listen to you in the shallows so that we can trust you in the deep. Lord, bless us today because I said it before and I'll say it again. We need you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.